Happens a lot, doesn't it, PJ? I think that I should preach with those sunglasses on, PJ. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> do you know how many people? <laughs> do you know? <laughs> do you know how mad those people do? These like, like Reuben Israel? No, I'd have to cut my... Yeah, he does. Yeah, he looks like he looks like. Yeah. Anyway, I better get going. So we on, brother. Hey, where's my live on air light at? Oh, you actually did that. Everybody else would just say whatever. Live. live. All right. Well, now this is going to be interesting, isn't it? Um. We're gonna. I'm gonna do this a little bit different uh, this afternoon here. We er, actually, it's almost this evening. We prayed a long time. Praise the Lord. That was a good time of prayer. Amen. Uh, but I want to talk about Luther's baptismal heresy. <laughs> All right. And you mean Doc's hero. Doc's hero. Yeah. Don't get me in trouble with the Ruckmanites. They already love me enough. I am. I'm practically part of the family. And uh um yeah. So anyway, Luther's baptismal heresy. I I I want to read you and then obviously we can get into a lot of different scriptures on. We understand what the Bible says about baptism. All right? Uh many things that Bible says about baptism, but Martin Luther was a reformed Catholic. Okay? So, so what do you mean by that? Well, exactly what I said. He was a Catholic. <laughs> he, just, he was a Catholic. I'm going to show you that the guy was a Catholic. And by the way, he didn't get his doctrine of baptism from those awful Anabaptists, did he? No, we're going to read about what he said about the Anabaptists. Um, he didn't like them, and I wouldn't like him either if I was a heretical baptismal regeneration preacher like he was. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I know people are the, Martin Luther is the hero. Well, he's really not. I mean, he's really not. Unless you believe that Christianity started with Martin Luther. I guess there's like this world that they actually, well, it all started with the Reformation. See, everybody was one church the whole time through. Where do you people get this from? It's not even accurate history. It's insanity is what it is. There was this, see, everybody was Roman Catholic, and then all of a sudden Martin Luther, he rediscovered salvation by grace through faith that was hidden for 500 years. Well, where was it hidden at? Was it hidden when the Waldensians were being burned? Was it hidden when the Anabaptists were being persecuted? Was it hidden when the Lollards were being persecuted? Was it hidden when the Paulations were being persecuted? Was it hidden when the Petrobrusians were being persecuted? Was it, was it hidden when uh, um, all of these sects of people, w w was it hidden when they were being burned? What were they being burned for? Salvation by grace through faith and baptism upon profession of faith in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Believer's baptism. And I could show you, and by the way, when you look through this, when you understand the history, go back and listen to the Baptist Battle for Liberty, because I can't go through all that right now. There's 12 shows, more coming, Lord willing. Uh, but I can't go back through all that history. But one thing I can tell you is if you trace it down through, you trace it, believer's baptism, what's closely aligned with that is a stand against the church and the state being merged together. A stand against dominion theology. Why? Because they were all being killed. They were being murdered for believers' baptism. That's what was happening to them. So they were standing up. So to, to act like, well, nobody had salvation until Martin Luther. And then it was rediscovered. I mean, that's the history they try to pull on people. It's like, who believes that nonsense? How do you even believe that as being true? That there were no Bible believers all the way through. They were all Roman Catholic. Well, who was Rome killing then? Who were they murdering? Yeah, oh, they were heretics. That's what they called them. Manichaeans, right? They were all Manichaeans. Why? Because Augustine and others like him said so? Oh, I don't have time to go down that road. I got to keep going. 
But I have no love for Augustine, let me tell you. All right, we'll save that for later. So I'm going to read you some of the quotes of Luther. Now, this, this is from a set that is, now, by the way, this set is Luther-friendly. It is printed by Concordia. Okay, it was printed by Concordia. I think it still is now. They print it. But this is an original print of that set, What Luther Says. This is an anthology anthology of everything that he said about certain topics of the Bible and everything else. So I'm not taking him out of context. I'm not taking his quotes and lifting him. This isn't from a Baptist, pe- Baptist people. <laughs> this I- these are Lutherans that are writing about Luther's writings and using his exact writings and what he said about baptism. Okay, so they'll get mad anyway, but that's okay. So let's get started, shall we? All right, well, actually, let's, what does the Bible say about baptism? It says, go ye into all, therefore, into, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. What is the emphasis on there? Believe. Believe. Okay, and I've got another verse for you. What doth hinder me to be baptized? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Wait a minute. Is that what Luther said? Nope, that's not what Luther said. And I'm going to show you what Luther says. Baptism, important because divinely instituted, he says. He said, the world is now full of sects which exclaim that baptism is merely an external matter. And that external matters are of no use. Now, nobody says that, by the way. He's, he's using a straw man argument so he can push his baptismal regeneration doctrine. That's what he's doing. However, let it be ever so much an external matter. Here stands God's word and command, which institute, establish, and confirm baptism. However, whatever God institutes and commands cannot be useless, but must be an altogether precious matter, even if it were worth less than a straw in appearance. Now, I have no problem with him saying that it was instituted by God because baptism was instituted by God. The problem is that it's, it doesn't mean what Martin Luther made baptism mean. Okay, here's another one. Uh, Luther, Luther's brief but comprehensive definition, the nature of baptism. Here's what he says. The question is, what is baptism? Luther says this. Baptism is not simple water only. But it is the water comprehended in God's command and connected with God's word. So what he's saying is because of the word of God that's spoken through there, that water changes into something else. Okay, that's what he's saying. I don't believe you. Okay, let me keep reading and then you'll catch on to it because that's exactly what he's saying because he's a Catholic and that's all he was. And I hope I make you reformers mad at me that when you listen to this and you don't like it, and that, that makes me like it even more. I know. Ah. Okay. I don't apologize for being a Baptist in case you haven't figured it out. I, I, I don't apologize. I'm not going to apologize for the trail of blood that I see behind me of all, those, of all those Baptists that died and were burned at the stake and their bodies mutilated and their babies killed. Why? Because they would not give in to Rome. And Luther just became mini Rome and set up his own kingdom just like Calvin did, all the rest of them. So you're going to find out as we go through this and then we talk about Calvinism versus Arminianism and everything else in the future that it's a narrow road. It's always been a narrow way. Okay, the blessings of baptism. He says, what does baptism give or profit? Answer, here it is, ready? It works forgiveness of sins, delivers from death and the devil. And gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare. Wait, baptism does it? It's like baptism replaces Jesus Christ, and they just insert baptism. What does that mean? That means man controls your salvation. Do you understand that? Anytime you see a baptismal regeneration heretic, here's the thing that always comes up. They believe like Luther believed. I remember sitting with a Lutheran, and I remember a Lutheran pastor. Man, did he ever, oh, man, he was mad at me. Like, you could just see him like, oh, he was mad. He was so angry. I asked him, so is there any salvation outside of the Lutheran church? No, there's no salvation outside of the church. No, 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 no. You No, this is a long time ago. This is when I first got saved, and I was really honoring. But, um, uh, (coughs) I still am, but it just, 
I was, I was, if you guys think you were Captain Extreme, you should have seen the way I was. And I, I mean, I was, oh, I was awful, man. I was extreme. I went to a meeting. Never mind. I, I was just, I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to tell you. I don't want to give you any ideas. I do not need to give you guys any ideas, believe me. He says, which are such words and promises of God? Answer, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, he that believeth that is baptized shall be saved, but, but he that believeth not shall be damned. But see, he uses baptism as the saving agent. The power of baptism. How can water do such great things? Answer by Martin Luther. You ready? Answer. It is not the water indeed that does them, but the word of God which is in and with the water and faith which trusts such word of God in the water. That's why the Luther say, and come, I heard this Luther say, Lutheran pastor says, and come to the saving waters of baptism. And they sprinkle the water over it. I'm like, what a bunch of creeps. For without, without the word of God, the water is simple water and no baptism. It's still simple water. <laughs> okay. But with the word of God, it is a baptism that is a gracious water of life and a washing of regeneration in the Holy Ghost, as St. Paul says. Titus chapter 3rd. Third, third. According to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration renewing of the Holy Ghost. So... What he's saying is, is that that's what that's. See, that means that water, the water saves you. You're saved in the water. Is that what you believe? Although Martin did want you to know that baptism is for human beings only, so don't try to baptize anything else. He did. He did want you to know that that baptism is not. Okay. All right. I'm gonna. And believe me, I'm not reading everything here, but I'm gonna read these. Okay. Next. Heretics, uh oh. Heretics misunderstand and condemn baptism. Okay, now before I get into this and read this, who do you think he's calling a heretic? There you go. That's right. That's who he's calling a heretic. Where did he get that from? Rome. That's where he got it from. Okay, you ready? He said, We should be on our guard against the Anabaptists. And sectarian spirits who speak contemptuously of baptism and say that it is nothing but ordinary water, which helps no one. Now, first of all, let me stop there and say this, that he's making it sound like Anabaptists didn't think anything of baptism. And that's no, that's he, they thought they they put baptism in its right perspective. They put blood before water. You understand that Baptists always believed in blood before water. That's what they held to down through the centuries, blood before water. You know what I mean by that, right? The blood of Christ before water. They look at the sacred act as a cow looks at a new door. For they see a poor preacher standing there or some woman who baptizes in an emergency. Okay, let me stop there. Okay, yeah, yeah. There's like, yes. There's a, there's a woman that would, if she's birthing, if the, a woman's being, a baby's being birthed or whatever, and then they say, well, we got an emergency. Now, now, okay, for you men, I want one of you to answer this question. Why did there have to be an emergency baptism? Right. So then what are they saying? Then? What, what is he saying saves that person? How is he not a heretic? Yes, he was an apostate. He was just a liar, a fraud. And yes, you say, well, didn't God use him? Absolutely God used him. I, I believe God used him. I believe he used him for the Bible translation and many other things. But there were a lot of wicked people that God allowed and used to do certain things. God used the Roman roads to spread the gospel, and Rome was wicked. Right. Right. So, by the way, and where do you see a ba where do you see in the Bible babies being baptized for emerg in emergencies? Yeah. Oh, by the way, there is no baby in the Bible being baptized. Right. Right. You can't even find a child in the Bible being baptized. You understand that? That's right. 
For they see a poor preacher standing there, or some woman who baptizes in an emergency, are offended at the sight and say, Indeed, what might baptism be? Moreover, they state, Whoever does not believe is really not baptized. Well, it's true. That's because they, they, that's, that's what the Bible says. What doth hinder me from being baptized? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. They have to be saved before they're baptized. Blood before water. In this way, Martin Luther says, they dishonor and blaspheme the most worthy sacrament, not seeing any farther than a horse or a cow sees. But here it is written that when Christ was baptized, all three persons of the Trinity were present, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and that the heavens stood open too. In fact, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit daily stand about at the side of our own baptism. For this reason, we should highly esteem and honor baptism and say baptism must not... Baptism was not devised by any human being, but God instituted it. Well, I agree that God instituted it. Right, but he changes the definition of what it is. And it is not simple water, he says. Martin says, Martin Luther says, it's not just water. It's not simple water, but God's word is in it and with it, which makes of its water a washing of the soul and a washing of regeneration. Uh huh. And see, he always had this like contradicting thing because here he says only faith appreciates baptism. Well, he just said now you're going to hear him say faith doesn't matter. You don't need faith to be baptized. That doesn't disannual baptism. <laughs> He's going to talk out of both sides as well. <laughs> he says one must not make this sweeping assertion. God is not worshipped by anything external. Therefore, we should not ridicule all things that are external in the worship of God. For when God speaks about a splinter, his word makes the splinter as important as the sun. It is therefore profane language to say that the water of baptism is only water. For the water of baptism has the word added to it. Therefore, it is like a glowing or fiery iron, which is as truly fire as it is iron and does all that fire usually does. I mean, okay, first of all, it sounds like you picked up some philosophy book somewhere and you tried to read it to somebody because that is the biggest bunch of nonsense I've ever heard in my life. And this guy is supposed to be some kind of stinking genius? It's just, it's goofy. It doesn't even sound good. How can this, I mean, how does it remotely even sound interesting? It's like, what did you mean by that? It's like, it's like saying, I, I don't know, I can't. I want to make fun of it worse, but I got to keep going. All right. Because it, it's just, <laughs> it's like me preaching and all of a sudden going like, and cookies are good. So that means baptism saved you. Yeah. That's like what he said. Did anybody make chocolate ch cookies and baptism saves you? That's what he's doing. It, it doesn't make it like, like, what is this analogy supposed to prove? It doesn't prove anything. But I guess it was the <laughs> they're coming out of the dark ages. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe it sounded good. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, but only the pious see and appreciate the word in the water. Wait a minute. It says, therefore, it is like a glowing or fiery iron. Yeah, I read that already. But only the pious see and appreciate the word in the water. A cow or a dog sees only water. <laughs> That's because he was calling the Anabaptist dogs, basically, and and cows. Such eyes of a dog and cows, those disputants bring to these sacred things who judge of ceremonies only as they see them. But they bring no ear to hear whether they have the promise or command of God. Doesn't it seem like to, to you that when you read his quotes about baptism, that what he's actually saying is like, if you read the words of God over this water, it magically changes this water. It's like he's a wizard and he's talking about like the yeah, it is. It's like it's like any other heathen ceremony that is used to try to save somebody with water or save somebody with one of the elements, right? That's what it's he's not speaking of biblical baptism. He's making it mystical and magical but applied to the water itself. Nowhere in the Bible do you see that baptism is applied that way ever. Right. It's, it's being made up. Right. That's why there's no salvation outside of the church, like they say. 
That's why. Okay, here's the next thing. The word gives baptism its value and power. When God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly, the water was no longer what it was at first, but now it was full of fish. (laughs) That's profound, Martin. Thank you. (laughs) Just so, baptism, too, is merely water before the word of God is added to it. It is ordinary water, of which a cow may otherwise drink. He had a fascination with cows drinking in water. (laughs) I don't know what it was, but he's always... Bring it up like cows drinking in water. He must have stared a lot at cows drinking. Here are cows drinking in the water. Just like a cow looks at water. He just keeps using that like over and over again. Yeah. Of which a cow may otherwise drink or which a cook may use for boiling and washing. However, when the word of God is pronounced over it so that baptism is to be administered In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, it possesses the power and might to wash away sin and to save from death. And then a note from the editor says, Therefore, baptism is not something merely external, like a badge pinned on a man, which works nothing in the man. Through baptism, Luther was convinced God works within a man. We find this thought colorfully expressed in a sermon on Titus 3, 5, and 6. Cut, colored. Anyway, by the word, anyway, the next one, by the word, God works in what seems an external right. So he says by the word, again, he says by the word of God, it works in there and changes things, changes the water. It is not that as our adversaries like to say, who, who are their adversaries? The Anabaptists, those are their adversaries. Right. Baptism is merely an outward token, like a distinguishing color, a symbol indicating that Christians hold together, are pious, and love one another. This is a Turkish doctrine. It is? He's saying it's a Muslim doctrine. That's what he means by Turk. It is trampling on the Christian doctrine and the sacrament. Baptism is not merely a coat of arms and a token. God did not give it to be the color of his court. He himself is there through his kindness and his love for men because he desires to dwell in me. It is not an empty token, but the power of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is there and does not merely mark me external before men, but makes a different person of me before God so that just as a person is born of a woman in sin, he is born of baptism to righteousness and life eternal. So guess what that means, guys? What that means is that if if you don't get if you don't get baptized, if, excuse me, if you don't get baptized, then what happens is is that you're going to go to hell. So it's not faith that saves you; it's it's water baptism that must save you. Right? It must be water baptism. So if you don't have that water baptism through the church, then you're. Yeah. What? Yeah. Is that Fido? What is that? Faith alone? Well, plus baptism. Yeah, it means grace. And the, you, have to, you, have, you have to define the terms. We believe in salvation by grace through faith. This is why this, the right, they're going to use this. You watch. When they merge together, they are using that this year, 2017. The Pope himself, he's going to use it. The Pope, he's going to use it himself. Um and that that listen, that is the badge of Antichrist that unites all of those wicked devils together is their infant baptism. It links them all together. And that's why we are going to be the hated very soon. Our adversaries say. That's what he said. Yes. Absolutely. From the cradle to the grave. Right. That's right. Absolutely. Okay, you ready? Christ with his cleansing blood is present in baptism. Whoever is baptized in Christ is baptized through his suffering and blood, 
or to state it more clearly, through baptism he is bathed in the blood of Christ and is cleansed from sins. For this reason, St. Paul calls baptism a washing of regeneration, and according to what Christians say in picture, the sacraments flow from the wounds of Christ, and what they say in picture is right. And that's why I'm a Baptist and not a Lutheran right there. Yep. Yep. Oh, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. You're absolutely right, brother. I'm going to I'm going to cover that too. Yep, you're right. That's exactly what they do. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, he did nail him on it. Yep. Okay. He says that uh therefore Christ and this is a comment made by the by the editor. Therefore Christ washes as it were the person who is being baptized with his forgiving blood. So says Luther in the sermon which contains selection number 121 and together with the previous discourse and constitutes one of the reformers pithiest. Did I say that right? Pithiest. Ooh, what a word. Presentations of this matter. I mean really you think this is genius? It's absolute heresy. It doesn't even say that in the Bible. You get you have faith before you're baptized, or you don't get baptized. Exactly. Okay, here's the next one. Christ washes, as it were, the baptized with his blood. Holy baptism has been purchased for us by the same blood which Christ shed for us and with which he paid for our sins. The blood, with its merit and power... Oh, this is really weird. He has deposited in baptism. Well, he didn't get it from the Bible. I don't know where he got it from. Pro maybe from Augustine. Sounds like it. He has deposited in baptism so that men attain it there. So we attain the forgiveness of sins through baptism. We attain the blood of Christ through baptism is what he's saying. Not through faith. For the person who is receiving baptism in faith is, in effect, actually being visibly washed with the blood of Christ and cleansed from sins. Baptism then assures the individual person of his forgiveness. While preaching on the story of the nobleman's son, whom Jesus healed, Luther remarked that one might think I too would be comforted if Christ were direct himself so specifically to me in particular. The reformer replies, this is just what he does in baptism. He found none of that in the Word of God. He just makes it all up. Because he learned it from Rome. He learned it from the Pope. He learned it from Rome. That's where he learned it. And this is why they hate, they've all, they hate Baptists. They've always hated them, and they always will hate them. That's why. Plain and simple. All right. Next one, the triune God. It, it, the triune God active in baptism. We should not doubt that at all that whatever one is being baptized, the heavens are assuredly open and the entire Trinity is present and through its own presence sanctifies and blesses the person being baptized. He also, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. They, it's, he also says validity of baptism unaffected by the character of the administrate. Now, why did he say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this to you, and I'm going to tell you why he said this, okay? Are you ready? He said this, do not consider what he is who administers baptism. To be sure, he ought to be personally virtuous and holy, but he adds nothing to baptism by his holiness, nor takes anything from it if he lacks it. You must not consider the person of him who stands there and baptizes, but rather what he does and what is going on there. He does not befoul and defile baptism by his wickedness, nor, conversely, does he hollow and better it by his piety. If I were baptized by St. Peter and another by Judas, Judas a knave, and St. Peter a pious apostle of Christ, Judas, a bad character, would not make the baptism bad. Conversely, the fact that St. Peter is a saint affects only his person, neither helps nor affects baptism in any respect. So a lost guy can baptize you. It doesn't matter. A lost guy could baptize you. Yeah, even Judas. 
could baptize you. Well, the Bible says that and Satan entered into him. And he could baptize you, and that doesn't change anything because it's magically delicious. Okay, now, let me let history lesson. Who knows why they taught that? Anybody know? Any man know why they taught that? Why, Brother Jacob? That's right. Bingo. He's got it right there. That's exactly what happened. The Donatist said, the Donatist rose up and said, listen, we, you got baptized by that stinking heathen over there? No, you're not coming into our church for that baptism. You, We are not accepting that. That guy's wicked. They're a bunch of immoral, wicked, adulterous devils, and we're not accepting that baptism. It, we don't even think they're saved. So you need to be baptized scripturally here in this church. That's what they said. They questioned the administer, and they questioned the church that they were baptized in. Oh, isn't that a novel idea? Yeah, it's actually been kind of a historic tenet of baptized believers or Baptist churches since the apostles. <laughs> that's, how it, that's how it's been. Unless you came through Rome. Sure. Yep. That's right. Yep. That's right, because they used the force of the state with that baptism to say that was a seal for them to go and take your land, your property, everything you own, and kill you, basically. Yeah, absolutely it is. It is, for sure. Amen. Yeah, they wouldn't twist the Bible to do that. Okay, next. Holy Trinity applies salvation to baptized. God is able to remove death and sin and all our misery and to give us eternal righteousness, life, and joy instead. Through what means does he do this? Through the blood of his dear son. This is the price that was paid and by which these blessings have been procured for us that we might obtain favor with him as Christ says. In John three sixteen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But the Holy Spirit must enlighten and warm us us with his fire so that by faith we may experience and feel these truths now since all this takes place in the holy sacrament of baptism not salvation but takes place in the holy sacrament of baptism he says we should in justice not like a cow consider it mere water by the very blood of the son of god and the very fire of the holy spirit in which the son sanctifies us through his blood the holy spirit bathes us with his fire and the and the Father quickens us through his light and splendor. Thus, all three persons are present, jointly produce the one divine result, and pour all their power into baptism. There's the, yeah, there's the cow. He likes that. This thought is not unusual in the writings of Luther. It is preserved for us by Dietrich in another sermon on Jesus' baptism, which the Reformer preached in his home in 1534. So there, that's where that sermon is. Okay, you ready? Here's the next one. Saving power of Trinity in baptism like medicine in water. Huh? It just gets better. It gets gooder and gooder, don't it? That's right. Who then would despise the fact that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are present? Who would call such water simple water only? Do we not see what sort of spice God casts into the water? And everything nice. If you cast sugar into water, oh, I forgot how goofy this one was. If you cast sugar into water, it is no longer water, but delicious claret or something else. Why then do we want to separate the word from the water so entirely in this case and say that the water is simple water only, just as if God's word, nay, God himself were not present with and in this water? 
God's in the water. Not so, for God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are indeed in and with this water. As they were there on the banks of the Jordan when Christ stood in the water, the Holy Spirit hovered over it and God the Father spoke. This is why baptism is a water that takes away sin, death, and every evil and helps us to enter heaven and eternal life. Oh, no, here we go. Such a delicious sugar water, aromatic and specific it has become because God himself has entered it. But God is a God of life. Since then, he is in this water. This must be the real aqua vitea, water of life, which drives away death and hell and makes one eternally alive. It's a delicious sugar water. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but how did anybody take this seriously? That's what I can't figure out. Like, when you, when you hear this, I mean, how do you even take this? And like all these dignified reformers, dignified reformers, let, let me, and, and they quote, let's quote Luther. So they quote Luther, and Luther says here, well, how about reading a sugar water quote? How about reading the sugar water quote? How come they don't read you that? They're very selective on what they read, what Luther says. And they skip over. Guess what they skip over? When's the last time you heard him really talk about what, what Luther says about baptism? That's why I'm doing it for you. What's that? Ruin the Dream. Shattered Dreams Ministries presents <laughs> Martin Luther's Baptismal Heresy. Yeah, Galatians and Romans, right, or the bondage of the will, which ju <laughs> I don't have time to go down that, but I'm going to throw this out at you, and I'm going to pick it up again some other time. But listen here and listen very closely. Just because Erasmus was wrong about some stuff doesn't mean Luther was right in that book about everything either. You just remember that, okay? We've got this problem here today where we think, well, see, Erasmus, he was clearly wrong. Yes, he was. He was wrong about stuff, but Luther wasn't right about everything either. The truth is right down that narrow road. Yeah, that's right. And by the time I'm done, I guarantee I'm going to have some Calvinists mad at me. I'm going to have some Armenians mad at me. But more Calvinists than Armenians probably. Just because there aren't really many more Armenians really around. There really aren't. That understand classic Armenianism. They're just not even around. So they're usually, what do you call them, Jacob? Pelagians, thank you. Yeah, that's what they are. They're Finneyites. No offense, Brother Finney. Not the Gerald Finneyites, but the Charles Finneyites. Anyway, that was, a f that was free. I just thought I'd throw that in there. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's it, which is different. Yep. Let's see, I read this to you already, I think. Okay, yep. Okay, saving power of the truth. Oh, I read you that. The medicine of the water, the sugar water. Yep, okay. He says, nor is this the view that the entire Holy Trinity is active in baptism, something exceptional. While Scripture does teach three distinct persons in the one divine essence, it at the same time tells us that the work of creation, that of redemption, were performed by the Holy Trinity. Luther pointed this out in a sermon preached in the famous castle church at Wittenberg in 1537. Anyway, yeah, whatever. Okay, the unborn not to be baptized, Martin Luther says. He says, no infants are not, he said, no, infants are not to be baptized, that, that is regenerated. Well, I didn't know you could regenerate an infant. I know you could regenerate anybody. Well, just, hey, I got this water up here, and I can regenerate you with this water. Who believes that nonsense? Rome. But it doesn't change the conduct, right? Yeah, he said that too, didn't he? I'm sure he did. He had to make an excuse for murdering people. All the reformers did. Wicked devils. Okay. <clears throat> I'll save that for another time. No, infants are not to be baptized. That is, regenerated, unless they have been born. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, listen, otherwise many absurdities would follow. Yeah, I mean, thanks, Martin. <laughs> thanks for clearing that up for us.
Thus the danger exists that an expectant mother may become weak and sick. Because of this, the fruit of the womb would then be baptized by pouring water on the abdomen of the mother. No, this should not be. <laughs> but the woman, but the women who are present at the birth should need listen, listen. But the women who are present at the birth should kneel down and with a prayer of faith commit the endangered infant to God who is mighty and able to do more than we ask. Without a doubt, he will accept the infant for the sake of the prayer of the believers. Luther believed that also in the light of the Old Testament, we have reason to hold the view of the mooted matter. Mooted? He expresses himself to this effect in a little writing of 1542 when he addressed a woman who suffered a mishap during their pregnancy. So he's saying, you know, if you pray, then that baby will go to heaven. If not, it'll probably go to hell. Of course it is. It's Augustinian. It's Augustinian. But we don't have time to get into that. But we will. Those other three friends that I had out there will all be gone. <laughs> okay, you ready? Next one. Luther says, commit unborn infants to God in prayer. Who would doubt that the children of Israel who died before having been circumcised on the eighth day were saved through the prayer of their parents based on the promise that God wanted to be their God? Therefore, we ought to speak differently and more comfor comforting, oops, sorry, comfortingly with Christian people from the way we speak with the heathen or what is the same thing with reprobates. This we should do also in those cases in which we do not know God's secret judgment. So what he's saying is, if, you know, if your baby dies... If you have a baby that dies and you're lost, then God's going to send that baby to hell because, you know, you weren't baptized and you weren't a Christian, so that baby's going to go to hell. Yeah, of course they did. To the end, Luther believed in the possibility of salvation for unborn and unbaptized infants, as appears from his lectures on Genesis delivered in the closing years of his life. God saved Lot through angels who conducted him out of the doomed city of Sodom. Thus says Lucer, the Lu Lucer, Lucifer, sorry. <laughs> Luther, Sifer, sorry. Thus says Luther, the Lord usually works through means of instruments, though he could and at times does work in a different matter. So anyway, uh, let's see, Luther believed... Moreover, it is said that God has not bound himself to his sacraments in such a manner, but through his word he has bound himself to us as to make it impossible for him to save unbaptized children without them in a way that it is unknown to us. Thus he saved many, even kings, under the Mosaic dispensation without their knowledge of this dispensation. Whatever. He says, thus I hold and hope that the gracious and merciful God intends something good also for children who without their fault and without the rejection of his public command do not receive baptism. I rather believe that because of the wickedness of the world, he did not want to have this publicly preached and believed lest everything he has ordained and commanded by despised by the world. For we see that because of the wickedness of this world, he commands much to which he does not obligate the godly. In short, in those who fear God, the spirit turns everything to a best, but the contrary, he is contrary. What he's basically saying is those those children are going to die and go to hell. When they die, they, those babies. Okay, here's another one. Baptism of infants, surely, if, I always say this word wrong. Thank you, efficacious. He says, I still maintain, as I have maintained in the postal, that, or postal, I don't know what that means, that the surest baptism is infant baptism. That's Martin. That's Luther. For an old person may deceive, he said, and may come to Christ as a Judas and permit himself to be baptized. But a child cannot deceive. He's talking about an infant. It comes to Christ in baptism as John came to him and as the little children were brought to him, that his word and work may come over them, touch them, and thus make them holy. For his word and work cannot pass by without effect, and in baptism they are directed at the child alone. If they were to fail of success here, they would have to be entire failures and useless means, which is impossible. So what's Luther saying? He's saying that children, he's saying that children are, are saved through infant baptism. He said that's the surest means is infant baptism. That's how they're saved. 
He said, because an adult can lie, but a baby can't lie. Yeah, but a baby can't believe either and have faith. Right. Old Testament circumcision. All right, he says this about it. The precept of circumcision is to be noted for us against the ragings of the Anabaptists. Yeah, because I know those, those Anabaptists, they were raging. Right? Oh, the babies are crying. Maybe they don't like this about circumcision. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> They're raging babies against... Anyway, for they hold that baptism must be repeated and that adults only should be baptized. Isn't that terrible? They actually, those Anabaptists actually believe that adults only should be baptized. That's terrible. Because infants do not have the use of their intellect. And where this is lacking, there can be no faith. But tell me, circumcision is of benefit, and we have said only because of faith. Now, God has enjoined the circumcision of infants on the eighth day and has given a very strong promise that he will care for them and preserve them. Therefore, either the command of circumcision was futile or infants, too, who are without all use of their intellect must have believed and through circumcision must by faith have obtained the righteousness which, with, which Abraham obtained before he received this right. Yeah, like where in the Bible does it say circumcision and baptism are the same thing? Right. Nothing. For the promise is given to the circumcised that they are the people of God and that God will be their God. That is, they enjoy the fellowship of the kingdom of God, justified by that faith which justifies, which God gives them through his spirit. I know by the editor says, of course, in the New as well as the Old Testament, eyes of faith are necessary to see it. But it is as truly Christ to whom the children are brought in baptism and by whom they are blessed, says Luther, as it was Christ who received the little ones in the gospel story. He just double speaks. They just they, they, they say this. They just double speak. No. No. Next, Christ through word works faith in infants. To be sure, children are brought to baptism by the faith and work of others. But when they get there and the pastor or baptizer deals with them in Christ's stead, it is he who blesses them and grants them faith and the kingdom of heaven. For the word and act of the pastor are the word and the work of Christ himself. That is popery, that's right. Objection. Unreasoning infants cannot believe. And here's Luther's answer. Are you ready? Luther's going to straighten those Anabaptists out. Here's what he says. Let us look at the person why they hold that children do not believe. They say since they have as yet not come to, uh, to use their reason, they cannot hear God's word. But where God's word cannot be heard, there can be no faith. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Tell me, is one who judges God's works in this way according to our ideas, speaking like a Christian? Children have not come to the use of their reason, you say, therefore they cannot believe. What if you have already fallen from faith through this reason, the children had come to faith through their unreason? What is he talking about? What if monkeys could fly? What does that have to do with anything? My friend, what good does reason do when faith in God's word are concerned? Is it not a fact that reason most violently resists faith and the faith... And the word of God, so that because of it, no one can come to faith or put up with God's word unless reason is blinded and put to shame. A man must die to reason and become a fool, so to speak. Yes, and must become more unreasoning and irrational than any young child is. Child, if he is to come to faith and accept God's grace, as Christ says, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. How often Christ points out to us that we must become children and fools, and how often he condemns reason. No, he's twisting it. Again, tell me, what sort of reason did the little children have whom Christ caressed and blessed and assigned to heaven? Surely they too were as yet without reason. Why then does he order that they be brought to him, and why does he bless them? Where did they get the faith that made them children of the kingdom of heaven? Where does it say they were the children of the kingdom of heaven? It doesn't say that. It says, it says not, to, not to, uh, uh, to push away or forsake the children. 
It doesn't say that they're automatically saved, that they came to this autom- they they were in the kingdom of heaven automatically. The fact is that just because they are unreasoning and foolish, they are better fitted to come to faith than the old and reasoning people whose way is always blocked by reason, which does not want to force its big head through the narrow door. <laughs> but since their reason so besets men, we must attack them with their own wisdom. Tell me, why do you baptize a man after he has come to the use of his reason? You reply, he hears the word of God and believes. I ask, how do you know? You say he confesses as much with his mouth. Should I say, what if he is lying and deceiving? Well, then he's lying and deceiving. That doesn't change the truth. Right. Uh, right. How does that change the truth? It doesn't. How does that make his argument of baptizing infants valid? This guy was considered a genius? After all, you cannot see his heart. Well, then, if in this instance you baptize only because a man has outwardly professed faith but are uncertain of his faith and must wonder whether he has more within his heart than you can observe, then neither his hearing nor confessing nor faith is of any avail, for it may be mere delusion and not a real faith. Who then are you to say that outward hearing and confessing are necessary for baptism? Well, we don't say it. God says it. God says it. What doth hinder me to be baptized? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. We didn't make it up, Martin. You should read the Bible. Or you should have. You're in hell now, but you should have read it when you're in heaven. That wasn't very nice. That'll make me a lot of Lutheran friends. I do have a lot of Lutheran friends. I'm invited to all the meetings. The local ministerial association. No, I'm not. That where these are not present, we should not baptize, and that we're, where they are present, we should. Is it not true that you must admit you have no right to do or to know more than that the person to be baptized be brought to you and that you are asked to administer baptism? You must believe or rather simply commit to God whether or not he really believes in his heart. Thereby you are excused and you baptize correctly. What a nut. Besides, tell me, where is the reason of the Christian believer where he is asleep, since his faith in God's grace admittedly never leave him? If then faith can continue without the cooperation and aware of awareness of reason, why should it not also begin in children before reason is aware of it? Commit the faith to him who commands them to be brought and baptized them at the, his command, saying, Lord, thou dost bring them here and dost command them to be baptized. Therefore, thou wilt surely answer for them. On this I depend. I dare not drive them away or forbid them baptism. Okay, so he says here, and here's another point that he says, baptize all only because of Christ's command, not because of their faith. You baptize all, not because of their faith, but because of Christ's command. Yeah, it is. Listen to this. You do not baptize children because, as you say, they do not believe. Why then do you preach the word to old folks who do not believe, but who may in the course of time probably come to believe? You certainly do this only because God has commanded it. For if you baptize me because I am able to say the words I believe, then you baptize me on the basis of me, myself, and in my own name and on no other basis. Since then it is unknown to you whether the person being baptized is believing or unbelieving. The baptizing is done solely because of God's command and behest. What a bunch of nonsense. It is circular reasoning. Right, he did. Yes, he did. He said, you generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Right. 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 Again, there, there. it says here, he said, what doth hinder me from being baptized? And what was the answer that he gave to him? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Right. Belief always proceed is before baptism, always. What's, yeah, it does. Anyway, that's what he says there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed it up here. Sorry, I know you guys, it's been long. So, Yet baptism is valid even though not believed, he says again. He says, no matter what my relation to faith may be, whether faith comes to me or endures, my faith or lack of faith neither contributes anything to baptism nor detracts anything from it. In fact, even though I were never to believe, baptism would still be right and complete. For it does not depend on my belief or unbelief, but on the ordinance and institution of Christ. Are you ready? If a designing Jew were now to come to us in order to deceive us, 
acted as if he wanted to become a Christian, desired baptism, so that the pastor or priest would baptize him in the water before our eyes and speak these words, I baptize thee in the name of the, the command of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, then the Jew would be really and truly baptized, although he would think nothing of it in his heart, but thereafter would publicly mock and blaspheme the sacrament. For if you do not believe, despite the order and command of God, God is not concerned. Are his ordinance and commands to mean nothing or to be nullified by your unbelief and misuse? Let it rather be as St. Paul says, although all men are false and given to lies, yet his word and ordinance are to be true and immovable. Blessed are you if you believe and use it to right. If you do not believe it, you receive it to your own damnation. It's like it makes no sense at all. First, he says it saves you. Then he says it doesn't save you. Then it says it, mean, it means something, but it doesn't mean something. That you, well, God commanded you to baptize everybody, so you just baptize everybody. No, he didn't command you to baptize everybody. That's right. Okay, here's another one. For faith is not of the essence of baptism. Some people see distinctly that simply taking water and pronouncing a word over it is not enough to constitute baptism. That is why they say one thing must still be added, namely faith. And they want to prove it by Mark 16, 16. Uh, let me read it to you. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Okay, here's what Martin says. Let me go back. I'm sorry. I lost my place here for a second. Oh, okay. If a desi- Okay, nope, oops, wrong one, sorry. Okay, he says here, and they want to prove it by Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Again, they adduce a passage from St. Augustine. The sacrament is constituted by the water and the word, not because it is spoken, but because it is believed. But what they say is also not correctly put. For because of a misunderstanding of this passage, they imagine that the word and the water constitute a sacrament only if those who receive it have faith. But they base baptism not on the ordinance of God, but on men, as though the word with the water were not strong enough to constitute baptism unless our faith were joined to it. And God's word and work thus had to derive their power and effectiveness from us. No, you know, he said faith doesn't have anything. It says it's not the essence. Faith has nothing to do with baptism. Okay, here's another one where he gets upset. He says... If only the harebrained and stupid fellows would teach. You did not believe when you were baptized as an infant. Therefore, since you have now grown up, begin to believe and be a Christian, a child is not to be baptized again, but he is to be instructed in the faith. For baptism once administered is of itself valid and is permanently valid baptism. Therefore, it is not to be repeated. Mm -hmm. We should teach thus. When God teaches, commands, or baptizes, his message is always the truth, whether it strikes a receptive or an unreceptive person. When the sun shines, it is and remains the sun, whether a man is dying or asleep, whether he sees the sun or not. Your wife is and remains your wife, even though you did not regard her as such, just so your prince is your government, even though you did not consider him a prince. A nut. Right. Baptism and the gospel are valid. Nothing is detracted from them nor added to them, even though I may not believe them. Okay. Baptism is valid even though a Jew received it for the sake of the money his sponsors give him, as frequently happens. Oh, yeah, they did that. They did that. Constantine did that. And a number, they did that in Rome. No, Constantine paid people to be baptized. He paid them good money to be baptized. Yeah, gave them gold and a robe and all kinds of stuff to build the kingdom. They were, and that's what they do through baptism. They build a kingdom on this earth. That's what they believe. Yep. As a preacher. I will then not say that it is the devil's baptism if the Jew were subsequently to come and say, I have sinned by permitting myself to be baptized for the sake of money. Now I want to believe. Teach and instruct me properly in the Christian faith. He has received a valid baptism. He must therefore in all instances differentiate between God's works and the person towards whom they are directed. Be our personal condition what it may. It does not invalidate God's work and word. Faith and unbelief do not affect personal benefit of baptism. I think this is, man, I got to hurry up here. There's so many of these. 
I, I covered that. I'll, I'll let that one go and keep moving here because there's so much that can be said. Okay, now this is important here because on the manner of applying the water in baptism. He says, baptism is called in Greek and Latin mercio, which means to plunge something entirely into water so that the water closes over it. And although in many places it no longer is customary to thrust and plunge children in the font of baptism, but only to pour the baptismal water on them out of the font, the former nonetheless is what should be done. And it would be right, according to the meaning of the word, that the infant or whoever is baptized be sunk entirely in the water and then drown out, drawn out again. For also in the German language, toff undoubtedly comes with, from the word tief and means that what is baptized is sunk deep into the water. This is also demanded by the significance of baptism. For baptism signifies that the old man and the sinful birth of the flesh and blood are to be wholly drowned by the grace of God. So he even admits that immersion is the, is the proper mode of baptism, but we're not going to do it. All the reformers, by the way, knew that immersion was, but we can't be like those dirty, rotten Anabaptists. We would have to submit to their baptism and admit that we were wrong. It is correct to say that baptism is, okay, here's, here's what Martin says. It is correct to say that baptism is a washing from sins. Yet that expression is too weak and mild to bring out the full meaning of baptism, for it is rather a symbol of death and resurrection. For this reason, I would have those who are to be baptized completely immersed in the water, as the word says. But it were well to give to so perfect and complete a matter a perfect and complete sign. So he's saying, you know, you should be immersed. That's really what baptism is. But none of them do it. Or very little, very few of them do it. He says to doubt this is to doubt God. Baptism is, isn't, listen to this, baptism is an eternal covenant which should remind us of God's grace and mercy. <laughs> to be baptized again is unnecessary. Now, why was he saying that? Because those awful Anabaptists out there were saying you weren't even born again. Why did you get, you weren't baptized, you just got wet. Right. Indeed, to be baptized again is unnecessary. Indeed, it is a grievous sin. Where does it say that in the Bible? I know he was scaring those people so they wouldn't be converted and they wouldn't be saved and then to get scripturally baptized. For to allow oneself to be baptized again amounts to charging God that he does not want to keep what he had once promised us. Wherever your heart wants to grow timid and fearful because of sins, call to mind the covenant which God has made with you in baptism at the beginning of your life and cling to the word and sacred sacrament whereby God has certified this covenant to you so that you are not to doubt the promise and forgiveness of sins. For the Holy Spirit intends to be in this word and act so that they will not be without benefit. Luther says satisfaction for later sins and the second plank unnecessary. He says, it is not true as some lie and deceive that Christ has rendered satisfaction only for the sins committed before baptism, but that we ourselves must render satisfaction for the future ones or for those following upon baptism. Nor is it true as St. Jerome dangerously and wrongly says that repentance is the second plank on which one must go forward if the ship of innocence is shattered after baptism. I want nothing to do with that second plank. The ship does not shatter. Baptism does not fail. The kingdom of grace does not fall, but as the psalm here says, abides forever over us. If, however, I do fall from the ship, I simply climb into it again. If I do turn away from baptism, I mean, what about turn away from Christ? What is baptism? I mean, if I do turn away from baptism, no, it's if you turn away from Christ. It's talking about Christ. Obviously, we don't believe you can lose your salvation, but the point is that if you're truly born again, but the, the point is that this is ridiculous. He, everything is baptism, not Jesus Christ. He said, I simply turn back to it. If I do stray from the kingdom of grace, I simply enter it again. Baptism, ship and grace remain forever and neither fall nor waver because of my failing and wavering. Otherwise, God himself, who promises to keep his grace forever, would also have to fail. He says this, by baptismal grace, God covers that sin that remains. By word, okay, can anybody find baptismal grace in the Bible? Yeah, it is sacerdotalism. That's right. What, can anybody find? And by the way, that's what the Paulatians, Petrovrusians, everybody battled against sac sacerdotalism. They battled it. They hated it. They knew it was false. 
Yeah, salvation through the ordinances. That's right. Um, they hated it because they knew it was false. Martin Luther says this, because of this, God will not count against him the impurity which still clings to him. Hence, he is pure rather through the gracious imputation of God than because of his own nature, as the prophet says. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. This faith is supremely necessary, for it is the ground of all comfort. He who does not have this faith must despair in his sins. For the sin which remains after baptism causes all good works to be impure before God. In consequence, we must hold boldly and fearlessly to our baptism. Oppose all sins and errors of conscience with it, and humbly say, I know very well that I do not have a single work which is pure, but surely I am baptized, and through my baptism, God, who cannot lie, has bound himself not to count my sin against me, but to slay it and blot it out. So when, when a Lutheran says salvation by grace through faith, what do they mean, Jacob? That's right. They mean, they, mean, they mean salvation comes through the sacraments. So baptism is a mode of grace to them. Uh, the Lord's Supper is a, is a form of grace to them. That's how grace is administered to them. They don't believe in salvation by grace through faith. They really don't believe what faith. They, because they define grace as the sacraments. They don't define grace like you and I define grace. Right, and only the church is saved. Right. Turn back to your baptismal grace. Yeah. Yeah, just remember that you were baptized as an infant, so you're cool. You're good. Right. And that they still tell you that. Lutherans tell you that today. Oh, I've, I've been sprinkled. I've been baptized and I've been confirmed. Confirmed in what? Hell? Mm hmm. As they rip your GoPro off and throw it on the ground. You know the Apostles' Creed. I won't say it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is so bad. Okay. Upon sinning, turn again to baptismal grace. Just as the truth of this divine promise once pronounced over us continues until death, so our faith in it should never cease, but should be nurtured and strengthened until death by the constant memory of the promise made to us in baptism. What promise? Remember your baptism. Therefore, when we rise again from sin or repent, we do nothing else than return to the power of the f and faith of, the, of baptism, from which we fell and come back to the promise then made to us, which we deserted when we sinned. Yeah, it is. It is. Welcome to Augustinianism. Welcome to the Reformers' theology. For the truth of the promise once made stands steadily, ever ready to receive us with open arms upon our return. So you see how rich a Christian or one who is baptized really is. See, a Christian is one who is baptized is what he's saying. But he's not liking it to faith in Christ. Even if he so desired, he is unable to lose, lose his salvation, however much he sins, unless he refuses to believe. For no sins except unbelief alone can condemn him. Well, now we know where the fundies got it. <laughs> At the same time, you see how dangerous, nay, how false it is to suppose that penance is the second plank after the shipwreck. How harmful an error is it to hold that the power of baptism is gone, that this ship is shattered. He calls baptism the good ship. A weirdo. This one solid and unsinkable ship stays on, and it is never splintered into driving timbers. Drifting timbers, sorry. It carries all who are brought to the haven of salvation. It is the truth of God giving us its promise in the sacraments. Of course, it does happen that many rashly leap from the ship into sea and perish. These are they who depart from the faith and the promise and plunge into sin. But the ship itself remains intact. It continues on its steady course. If a man is able to return to the ship by an act of grace, he is borne on to life, not on any plank, but by the seaworthy ship herself. This is he who returns to the stable and settled promise of God through faith. It is bizarre. 
Anyway, I won't read you this quote, but he called this one's called The Good Ship Baptism Never Founders. But I'm not going to read you that one because it's too long. He says this, baptism, a great abiding comfort. There is on earth no greater comfort than baptism. <laughs> what about the Holy Ghost? <laughs> the Comforter, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you, whatsoever I have commanded you. What? <laughs> Dude, seriously, it's not, it's not, remember Christ, nothing gives me comfort like Christ does. No, it's nothing gives me comfort like my bat, like the sugary waters of baptism. It's all baptism. That's what he said the whole time. It's like, nothing should comfort us like our baptism. The good ship baptism. Now, now listen, when you hear that, he has replaced Christ with baptism. Do you see that? Everywhere where in the Bible that speaks of Christ and his ministry and the Holy Ghost and his ministry, Martin Luther has replaced with baptism. Now I ask you, why? Before I move on, I'm almost done. Bear with me. I just got a two, like two or three more quotes and I'm done here. Yeah, actually two. Why? Why has he replaced that? Because what does that do for someone if baptism is the answer? That is the power of the church state. Baptism, because, hey, there's no salvation outside of the church. So whether you like it or not, heathen, you're getting baptized. So they didn't do that, did they? Well, I'm going to preach a message to you sometime in the future, and I can't wait to do it. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to talk about it's going to talk about how Calvin's Geneva was no Rhode Island. It's going to be good. And it's going to be real good. It's going to be big. It's going to be huge. It's going to be hugely big and tremendous. It is going to be tremendous. I'm telling you, we're going to do great things. Um, it's going to be big. It's going to be huge. I'm not, I can't get, I have like four years of Donald Trump, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm sorry, but when I hear that all the time, I'm just going to listen to it, and I'm just going to keep saying it. It's going to be terrible. And I'm going to get it down better as I go, too. It's going to get better. But anyway, it's going to be It's going to be great. Anyway. Well, he w he did Luther in his defense. He did stand against the indulgences. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But it was still see if you say there's no salvation outside of the church, what you're saying is the church controls salvation. And I would say to you, there's no salvation outside of Christ. And why, if Christ saved you, would you want to be outside of His church? The problem is that they weren't His church. They were persecuting His church. Just like, and what happens is that baptism was used to control them. Because when they went into the colonies and, and Calvin's Geneva, if you didn't follow Calvin's rules, Calvin wanted to name your children. All right, I, can't, I don't have time to get into that because we've got to go home. But, but there's so many, and I can't wait. I'm going to put it together, and I can't wait to preach that because it's going to be good. But anyway, he, but they, they did it in the colonies too, though. They forced baptism on them. They tried to force baptism on them and to support their ministers. And if they didn't, they persecuted them or they banished them. If they held private meetings, they banished them. They wanted them to be baptized by their people. And it wasn't even baptism. Okay. At death, we intend... Okay, and then lastly, I'll close with Martin's heresy, Martin Luther's heresy on baptism, with this. At death, we intend to think... Of our baptism. When our last hour comes, we intend to clothe ourselves in the vestment of baptismal grace and hear the absolution of faith and pass away. That. So, what Martin Luther is telling you is that, yes, at the end of my life, I don't think about Christ Jesus my Lord, I think about my baptism. That is extremely creepy. It was almost like he really didn't come out of the Catholic Church. It was almost like he actually just tried to reform the Catholic Church. It was almost like he rejected light that he was given and persecuted those that 
gave the true light. Yeah, there are rumors of Rosicrucianism, that's right, with Martin Luther, and that's something I would love to investigate sometime. I'm not I'm certainly not done with little Martin's heresies. We'll we'll visit that we'll visit his heresies again. I, I plan on talking about the Lord's Supper and Martin Luther as well, because I think it's important to understand what he believed about that. Okay, transubstantiation, or no, uh, consubstantiation, yep, uh, which is a little bit different than Rome's, but pretty much the same. They believe the presence was there. The presence is there. That's why one guy came up to me and said, you don't believe the presence is there. You don't even believe the presence is there. Remember that guy on the street and he kept yelling at me? I was at the gay pride place, yeah, gay pride parade, or I mean event. Yeah, he kept yelling at me, you don't believe the presence is there. No, I don't believe I'm eating Jesus, you weirdo. Amen. You stinking creep. Right. And he was like shouting me down. This old man was like shouting. I mean, he wouldn't stop. Because he has devils, that's why. Anyway, so I don't think there's any question, should be any questions in anybody's mind that Martin Luther did not understand baptism or salvation. What his by grace through faith is, is not what your by grace through faith is. You believe what the Bible says, by grace is the grace of Christ Jesus. It's not baptism. You don't replace grace with baptism. And you don't replace uh, the grace with the ordinances. And you don't, means of grace. You don't replace it with means of grace for salvation. We don't believe in the sacraments. We believe in ordinances of the local New Testament church that God instituted. And we do not believe they save you. We believe that they are in obedience to Christ Jesus and his commands after salvation. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest be baptized. That's what the Bible says. Martin didn't believe that, though. And that was one of the easiest verses to figure out. And I would say that he didn't believe it on purpose. I don't think it was an accident. You have to understand those were dark times. I know, but he could read, and he had and he had the Bible, and he had believers bat, and he and he knew about people with believers baptism. He also knew those men, and then he persecuted them. Yeah, and he persecuted those men. The Anabaptist told him, and then he persecuted them. I won't even. We won't even talk about his. Okay, I don't have time. We got to go. Okay, so we're gonna pray. We're gonna get out of here. But I I want this online first. By the way, on sermon audio, I want this one on first. Amen. Now it will. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we do know the truth, what you say about baptism, Lord. And that a man must believe the gospel. He must repent and put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus saves. The blood always comes before water. It is the blood of Christ that saves. It is the blood of Christ that cleanses from all sin. And we don't find the blood of Christ in baptismal water. The blood of Christ was shed on the cross for our sins. And we believe by faith. And we've repented and put our faith and trust in Christ alone for salvation. Jesus is to be exalted. Baptism is an ordinance for the saved. Not for babies and not for unbelievers, but for those that have been born again in Christ Jesus. Help us, Lord, always to stand for that, even through times of persecution that will come. Many men will hate what was said today, Lord, but the truth has been shared. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.